Welcome to the Big Freeze Art Festival at the Scott Polar Research Institute. My name's Charlotte Connolly and I'm the museum curator at the Polar Museum, which is based at the Institute, which in turn is part of the University of Cambridge in the UK. And I'm joined by three guests today and I'd like to invite each of my guests to introduce themselves, where you're logging in from and the film that we'll be featuring in our festival. So could I start with Asinayak? Hi. Uh, so my name is Asinayak and I'm from Inukturak Nunavik, but I've grown up and currently live in uh, Montreal, um, Quebec. And but, uh, my film that is showing here is called 3000. And can you tell us a little bit about what 3000 is about? Uh, so 3000 is a like kind of experimental documentary that uses archives and animation to look at the past and a potential future. Then next up we've got Alethea. Hi, um, Alethea Agil Alnakopura and I am from Iqaluit uh, in Nunavut in the Arctic of Canada, just a bit north of Asinaya, I guess. Um, and the documentary Dunnit, uh, which I directed, is showing here, um, and it's about uh, my journey to research um, the history of traditional Inuit uh, tattoos, which you can see I've got a uh, love of tattoos, um, before getting them myself. Um, at it, it was a reclamation, I guess, of a custom that had very nearly disappeared in our area. So. Thank you. And then Nyla. Hi there. My name is Nyla Nukshuk and I'm zooming in from Toronto. Um, I have both Indigenous ancestry. My family's from Igloolik. I also have settler Canadian ancestry. Um, and the film that I'm going to be sharing is called Breaths. It's a documentary that I directed a few years ago with with the amazing Susan Glugark in partnership with the National Film Board of Canada. Um, and I actually just got the chance to watch it recently. So I'm excited to share it again here. Fantastic, thank you. Now there's a, a line in breaths where Susan Aglulark says, I didn't know how to ask my parents about the old traditional ways because I didn't know to ask. I didn't know how to figure myself out. And to me, that comment seems to strike right to the very heart of what each of these films are about. Inuit traditions were systematically dismantled in a turbulent period of colonization in, in Arctic Canada. And these films are all part of reclaiming those traditions and figuring yourselves out. I wonder, Nyla, as Breath was the film that you directed, if I could perhaps come to you first. Uh, it was clearly very personal for Susan Aglulark. And how was it for you as, your, as the film's director? Uh, thank you. Um... It was uh, great to be working with Susan, but I think you're right that it uh, certainly with some of the issues that, uh, you know, Susan dealt with growing up, uh, issues of identity and, and kind of where she fit in. And then certainly as she kind of, kind of became this Canadian and international pop star, uh, how she kind of fit in and, and, and that sort of thing. Um, and it was actually, you know, it, it was really surprising for me to hear about that a lot of, um, uh, of people in the UK aren't very familiar with the colonial history of, um, of Canada. Um, and because it's, it's something that is very, very much a, a present in, in both present day Canada, um, the British uh, colonization of Canada, um, our, our kind of relationship to, um, to the UK. And then of course, every single, um, you know, person, their family has um, been through this really kind of huge trauma um, that has affected everyone. Um, and so it's this really big shift that happened very recently. Um, and it, it included, um, you know, the removal of children from their from their parents and input being put into residential schools where they were, you know, cruelly punished for, for speaking their own language and and made to feel a lot of shame in in who they were as Inuit. 
And that was something that, you know, my, my father went through. Um, and so if you're, you know, I didn't go through that experience, but that's something that would impact me and my family. And you can see how that kind of, that processing of shame and, and questioning identity is, is really kind of seeps into, into everything. Um, but there's also a lot of joy and there's a lot of joy that comes with reclamation and understanding that, you know, what your, your culture and who you are isn't actually satanic and devil worship and, and all of these things. Um, and, and finding that, and of course the, this community that comes with, with that process and, and what's so exciting and what's so exciting about, you know, a Cineac's work as well of talking about the future, um, is that for Inui, we were made to kind of think that, you know, we didn't have a future with our cultural identity intact. Um, so to kind of imagine these futures and fantastical scenarios or sci-fi situations where we have these things and, and we're proud of those things, it is kind of a, a form of rebellion almost. And that's a good opportunity to talk, Asiniak, about your film. I think right at the start, there's a moment where it says my, my father or my grandfather was born in an igloo and I was born in a hospital with jaundice. And there's a really clear generational reckoning going on there. How do you see your film sort of shaping up and how do you see it informing the next generation as well? Well, I think that um, one of the reasons that um, like, well, one of the reasons that I kind of discovered to make the film while I was like researching and talking to my family um, actually was like, because there are a lot of youth and also like, um, kind of like in you of every age who have different um, knowledges and like relationships to what colonialism is. And um, like, I just remember one of my nieces kind of like, maybe she forgot, maybe she didn't know, but I was like, you know, like white people haven't always been here. And like, we, we did our own thing. And like, somehow she didn't know. So I think it's really important to have lots of different ways to share um, history. And it is important to have work that's like film and also to talk about it with our families. <laughs> Um, to be able to have records of what's happened. So I think like definitely one of the reasons to make the film and yeah, to have like animals and land and people and to like make it really rich and vibrant is um, to help like share in a way that is like beautiful to look at something that is like a hard history and it is important for us to know. And luckily, like, um, I have got to travel a lot all over the Inuit Nunat in like, yeah, in um, lots of places to see schools and kids and share the film and talk a little bit about it and our history and where we could go. So I have had a lot of fun doing that. Mm -hmm. Alicia, one of the, the really poignant things in your film, Tunia, is you're trying to speak to elders about tattoos and they've been taught to be ashamed of that history of themselves as well and trying to kind of peel back the layers and, and give them almost the confidence that they need to be able to speak about that. Yeah, I mean, of course, you only see the elders in the film that were willing to go on camera. Um, there were lots that weren't. Um, and there were a lot of Inuit that were upset with me for even talking about uh, tattoos at all. Um, never mind like getting tattooed because, you know, at the beginning of the process of making the film, um, there was one last living elder that had um, face tattoos. And um, so, you know, it was like this custom was just almost gone. Um, and 
a lot of people thought it was absurd. I was trying to bring it back, like um, that I wanted to hear about it. And it's like, are we allowed to talk about this again? Is this still taboo? Um, and when people had so little understanding of what the, what the tradition was, they didn't know if it was anti-Christian um, or of the old spirituality and uh, whether it was tied up with shamanism. And so there were a lot of, there was a lot of anxiety because uh, many of our communities are really Christianized now. Um, the the uh, missionaries that came from um, the UK and, and France and, Germany and, um, you know, uh, on the Alaskan side, it was Russian, a lot of Russian missionaries that were kind of attacked from all angles. Um, they all kind of universally condemned the old spirituality and our communities are still wrestling with the repercussions of that today. Um, that, you know, these, these um, uh, new rules kind of made it um, illegal for us to be ourselves, basically. Um, and so it was kind of a, um, a sensitive discussion to open up. And, um, you know, I was really, really grateful to the elders that were willing to step on, on screen mm -hmm. um, and say the things that they said publicly, um, because it just kind of unshamed the whole custom for a lot of us. Um, and, um, you know, to hear one of the elders in the film say, what I'm about to say, I say without shame. Mm -hmm. That just, it still um, reverberates for me. It's still, it's still a reminder for me on a, on a regular basis to, um, you know, consider feelings of shame and, and whether they're, whether I've earned them or whether it's something being unfairly put on me. Um, and that's something that we constantly have to reassess for ourselves as Inuit because the school system and the, the church and, and everything colonial basically um, tried to wipe us out and make us ashamed of who we are. Um, and in some instances, it was active, um, you know, um, genocide. Uh, and in some inst instances, it was a desire to um, gradually weed us out, intermarry and assimilate and hope that we disappear more gradually. Um, but the aim was still genocide to, to wipe us off the face of the earth. So um, these, these uh, stories of um, culture and language and custom are, are very much um, are very important for us to reclaim and um, assert that we are still here and not disappearing mm -hmm. because people still keep trying to tell stories like we're we're gradually disappearing and it, the opposite is true we're the fastest growing population in Canada <laughs> is that right <laughs> and do you have a sense of how many women do have face tattoos now I remember at the end of the film you sort of you could count on your fingers the yeah, I could count on one hand um, at the time we filmed. Um, when I started the film, there were none. And then uh, by the time we finished the film, there was a handful of us all across the entire Arctic, including Alaska and um, Greenland. But um, now it would be hundreds. Um, uh, oh, on the face, I'm not sure. I'm sure it's past 100 now. Yeah. Um, it must be a few hundred at least, but the, of course we have also like all over our bodies, the traditional tattoos and there are thousands of Inuit now with those for sure. Mm -hmm. So you talk there about um, reclaiming the narratives. Now in museums like the one I work in at the Polar Museum, we've got a collection of archive documents, artworks, published narratives that date back centuries in some cases that have really set the standard stories we've told about Arctic peoples. Now, on the one hand, perhaps they're valuable accounts because they offer, for example, depictions of tattooed Inuit women that would otherwise have been lost. But on the other hand, they're produced very much with a European gaze and a colonizer's gaze. So I'm interested not only in how the subject of your films, particularly Breaths and Tinnit, are about reclaiming specific traditions in the form of throat singing and tattooing, but also how making them films themselves is an act of reclaiming the narrative. 
So this first image is a watercolour by John Ross, who was a Royal Navy officer. It's a portrait of a woman he called Kangwagyu. I don't know if that's a good pronunciation. Um, and you can just about see in this image that there are face tattoos marked on there. Um, he also, he described her as a woman believed to be above 60. Um, he talked a bit about her family relationships. Um, then let me move on. So I've got a few of these John Ross portraits. Uh, this is another one, this is Tenikshu. Again, you, you can't see so well in this picture, but there are tattoos marked on her face. And then another one, a portrait of Nancy, which doesn't sound like a, a Inuit name necessarily, um, but you can see holding an ulu. Um, they're all in the, the traditional clothing. Um, and then accompanied by this is a piece of text that I'm just gonna pop on screen um, where John Ross writes about tattoos. Um, I won't read all of it out, um, but one of the things he says in amongst the descriptions of the tattoos, how they're placed three vertically across the chin, a double line around the neck and so on. He says, these were ornamental devices, but without any meaning. And all the women were tattooed exactly in the same way. So I'm, I'm curious as to how the three of you respond to these kind of accounts, because as I say, on the one hand, are they, they're useful, but on the other hand, they're setting a particular type of narrative and a particular way of viewing Arctic peoples. Yeah, I mean, maybe I'll jump in just because of <laughs> with the tattoos in particular, I spent a lot of uh, time researching them. Um, you know, there's, there's a reason that uh, in my documentary, all of the knowledge that's shared comes from living elders that um, remember the tattoos that they witnessed with their own eyes on their mothers and their grandmothers. Um, there's a reason I chose to go that way um, because I had been re researching the written record for years and really found such discrepancies and, um, you know, just things that even I as a, a young Inuk woman at the time um, with very little access to information about them, things that I just immediately knew not to be true. Um, so I, I decided to go with the knowledge of elders that was um, you know, corroborated, confirmed, uh, consistent, um, that we could trust because the, you know, as you say, the colonial gaze is, um, of course, very biased and, and uninformed about who we were as people. And, and so these um, explorers and researchers and ethnographers would kind of plop in for a short period of time, take notes, um, you know, ascribe all kinds of their own assumptions um, onto a situation and, and um, were not always careful about writing down what they were actually witnessing with their own eyes and hearing with their own ears. Um, it, it, they were, they weren't, weren't always separating what they witnessed from what their assumptions or, or um, you know, they're, at times they're basically guessing at things. Um, and I think that's work that needs to be done to examine the historical record, the written record and all the drawings. Um, and it, it, it's something that I'm working on now with the fellow um, Inuit tattoo nerd <laughs> um, who's based in Greenland. Um, but it, it, it's every scrap of information you get from non-Inuit from hundreds of years ago, you really have to analyze um, where were they um, collecting this information, How, which information is statement of fact and which is um, a guess. Um, because for example, in that piece of text you just brought up, he says that there's no meaning to the tattoos. Um, and we just know that to not be true. Um, it is categorically untrue. The person he spoke with may not have been interested in sharing it with him, um, or, you know, maybe he didn't have a, the ability to speak the language. I don't know, um, but we just know that that's not true. However, I find the, the description of the tattoos really fascinating and it's, it's really uh, been um, very, very helpful at times, especially with the drawings, um, to have descriptions of tattoos. Um, because we have a sense of the common patterns that were used all across the north, but to have a snapshot in time, um, which 
uh, patterns and placements were popular in that location at that time is just really neat to, to, have, to have that snapshot uh, from people who were documenting it at the time. So um, they're, they're extremely valuable, but you have to analyze the information carefully and, and people who know the, the culture and the place um, need to be the ones who examine that information and, and, and um, take the useful information out of it. Mm -hmm. And Nyla, with the throat singing, how much archive material was there to draw upon, or was it much more a, a tradition that was passed down um, sort of orally from person to person? Um, <clears throat> I don't know if I'm the necessarily the, the right person to ask. Um, I think that certainly there is a different way that, that kind of, um, the, the, I mean, and I should start by saying there's a, I was about to say the North and the South and in Canada, when we're talking about the, we talk about the Arctic and then it's like everywhere else is like the South. Mm -hmm. um, and so if I'm like, oh yeah, down South, I just mean like the rest of Canada um, and, or the UK or wherever you guys are the down South. Mm -hmm. um, and but, and now there's like, when you kind of see throat singing, a lot of the time it's this, it's kind of performative. Um, and it was something that was actually, you know, um, it, it wasn't, it wasn't a performance. It was actually something between, it was like a game and it's, you're actually, it's like you're mimicking another person's voice and intonations. And there are certain songs that, that people know and will pass down. And it's, there are certain songs that people will know, and I certainly myself am not an expert throat singer. Um, I'm actually really, really terrible. Um, but um, I think that then there's now really kind of, um, e even with uh, Tanya Tagak, who we're working with, I say we because Alethea is um, a part of Slashback as well, but having, we're kind of, she is a throat singer, a contemporary throat singer, who's really doing something totally um, unique and new. It's a create, it's like her own kind of um, uh, creation almost this, uh, the use of, of an inspiration of throat singing into this new performance. And we're kind of working with her and some of the ways that she uses her voice and these kind of gut guttural intonations and things like that to, to inspire some of the monsters in, in Slashback, this um, alien movie we're, we're working on and hopefully finishing one of these days. Um, and uh, so I think that with that, what's so great is that, you know, she's, this is something that, that was really, you know, it was banned. And, and I was, I remember seeing um, a, uh, a screening, one of the first screenings of Alethea's film um, in, in Nunavut. And I just happened to be there at the time. And, and it was really impactful um, for people to see this representation on screen because they, it was just something that had been rebranded as to mean something totally different than what it was. Um, and, and, you know, someone in the audience had remembered a relative who had, you know, died with these tattoos and they'd felt shame in that. And it was this thing where to be able to kind of instead reframe that to be prideful, it's a really, you know, it, that context is really, really important. And, and that's why, you know, especially with like when we're having these contexts and seeing, you know, these, the, this artwork or, or um, uh, researchers notes or anything to not have the full conversation and the context um, is, uh, you know, you're not really, you're not really seeing the full thing. Mm -hmm. And Asinayek, so in your film, you you embraced so much of this archive material. You make use of propaganda films and newsreel, uh, all sorts. How, how did you make that your own? And what kind of processes did you go through in internal conversations about contextualizing this kind of material? Well, I will say the first time around, I like looked through every single clip in the archive at the National Film Board of Canada. And um, I made a big mistake the first time around because I was really 
looking for specific things and really putting my own, like my own projections onto everything and not spending time to listen. So I had to do it all over again and um, actually like take the time to listen. And um, I was on the second time around really paying attention to what the archive itself was saying. And one of the things that's really exciting to see in the film is the change of perspective on the archive. Um, like you mentioned, there's propaganda um, film work that was like, there's like films that were blatantly made to show like Southern Canadians who were getting worried about like what was happening uh, in the North and um, the government made like propaganda films to say like, oh, don't worry about it. We're educating them. We're all good. They're okay. Don't worry about it. And um, it's like, so just like looking when you like, when I started to really pay attention to what the, the, the archive was saying, it was like a very clear picture and also like a change of relationship with the camera going from a very invasive camera to like kind of being like um, having fun with it a little bit to becoming like kind of like don't spy on me go away <laughs> and um, finally taking up the camera for ourselves and telling our own stories so mm -hmm. that's one of the exciting things um, that can be read well while looking at it and um Alethea has handily just put in the chat that you've been doing some <laughs> curatorial work in an art gallery yourself as well. Could you say a little bit about that and how curating material, is it a similar process to the filmmaking process or is it different when you're working with the 3D tangible objects? Well, I think for myself, um, what's fun about curating is get to getting to support people and getting like, I think I have my own perspective. I have a very strong perspective and I love sharing it, but I think it's also important to like acknowledge that my voice isn't the only one and it's not the only important one to listen to. So that's one of the reasons I love um, working with other artists and getting to share artwork from other artists. And um, I think when it comes to curating, it's similar to filmmaking because it's storytelling. And if you want to, you can tell a story through the way, what you include, how you position it. And um, that's pretty exciting too. And I think a really important point, I don't know if you're having the same conversations over in Canada, but in the UK, we're having a lot of conversations at the minute where people are trying to claim that museums are neutral, we're not political, but of course, that storytelling activity has been happening throughout because people have chosen yeah. what to acquire and what to put into the museum. So, um, yeah. It's really true. Uh, on this exhibition that's opening at the new building in Winnipeg called Um it's called Inua and we're four Inuit curators working on it together. And for the opening kind of room of the exhibition, we open the gallery with work that's from our family and ancestors. Mm -hmm. So as to give you an idea of whose exhibition this is, what's the perspective it's coming from with no illusion that it's like neutral. <laughs> it's like, it's important to know where something's coming from. Like I realized recently that sometimes you see like a book from a I don't know, from an institution that doesn't have an author's name on it. And like, I don't want to touch it. Like, if I don't know whose perspective I'm looking at, then I'm not really interested at all. Uh, so speaking of authorship then, um, so we asked our, our university students if they had any questions. And one of our students asked about uh, gender and what role that plays. Now, it wasn't planned, but it turned out that we selected three films and they were all by women filmmakers and powerful women are integral to the subjects of the films as well. Um, so the question from the student then is, um, what role does gender play behind the scenes? Does it shape your filmmaking process at all? I don't know if any of you particularly want to jump in with that. Uh, maybe I'll jump in for a second there. I think, you know, 
gender um, has definitely played a role in access for me, um, particularly in documentary, just uh, access to information. And um, because the traditional tattoos that I documented in my film were, were women's tattoos, um, I think it, it helped me um, gain access to knowledge from elders that were willing to talk to me about it. Um, I didn't get nearly as much information about men's tattoos. I got very little information about them. I, I think it's partly because men were not tattooed as heavily. It's also partly because, um, you know, the people just don't know as much about them um, because they were less common. But I also think that a lot of that had to do with the fact that I'm a woman and I, I still hope that someday um, a young man will um, go on the same journey I did and, and document uh, men's traditional tattoos because they did exist. Um, so, you know, um, different cultures have different customs around knowledge sharing. And in Western society, it's very much, you know, anyone has the right to any information and anyone can do research and there are no barriers in that sense. And, um, you know, of course, to some extent, that's true um, for us as well, but it, it's, you know, I think uh, in the past um, certain information was not shared with everybody and so it, it, it can help um, sometimes to, I mean, I think no matter what subject you're working on, access is always a question. Perspective is always a question. Um, and trust between um, the documentarian and their subject is, is also a you know, something to be negotiated. So um, another film that I made was called Angry Inuk and it was um, very much about how Inuit have been affected by animal rights activists uh, campaigning against seal hunting, which is incredibly important to our communities, always has been and, and always will be. Um, and I'm not a hunter and most of our hunters are men. There are women hunters as well, but most are men. Um, and I think it, it went a long way to have an Inuk male seal hunter as a director of photography on my documentary. Um, so, you know, it, it, um, it definitely informs on, on certain subjects, it, it matters. Um, sometimes it doesn't, um, but sometimes it does just, just like you were saying with, um, museums, I, I don't think they're ever apolitical. I don't think um, you, you can ever claim to be um, objective. I think there's it's delusional to think that um, an institution like that can be objective. Um, it is coming from a place of, um, you know, assuming that one particular culture um, is the norm. It, it's it's um, um, centering uh, one language, one culture, and and um, it it just doesn't make any sense to me because um, in storytelling, it it always matters who's who the storyteller is, and I think positioning yourself is important. Mm -hmm. And so, as Sinayak, with your more kind of archive material based work, and then your Im imaginings of the future, do you think gender plays a, a role in there? Um, not like an important role for me. I think the only thing I can think of contributing is that at the end of the film, um, there's like a, a, like time traveling, me and my dad standing on the hilltop. And I was like, kind of like, that was important to me. Um, but at the same time, I was thinking it would have been like, also cool to because I think people will often read it as a couple and not know it's like me and my dad and it would have also been cool to have um, uh, included something that was um, a positive future supportive of like all of our queer Inuit and um, that's uh, what's important to me as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I want them to know they're included in my future. <laughs> well, hopefully they'll all watch this and then they'll know. <laughs> and Nyla, I don't know if you've got any thoughts as well on, on that particular question around gender and whether it affects behind the scenes. 
Um, only, only so much. I in Toronto, I, I do a lot of work with interactive stuff. Like I'm, I just love um, things like video games and virtual reality and augmented reality. Um, and I'm working on specifically an augment, augmented reality thing that's in partnership with a gallery, which is uh, why I'm, you know, I mentioned I was curious earlier. Um, and certainly the technology space can can have fewer women in it, I found. Um, and that can it can be kind of an intimidating um, kind of thing to walk into. Um, but it's changing all the time. I think gender representation is, you know, there's especially with younger people and and I just got finished working with a bunch of, of teenagers and, you know, they're 14, 15, some of them younger. And it's like they're they're they love video games and comic books and that sort of thing. And um, exploring that kind of nerdy stuff is 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 something that I don't think um, is you know, it's something that's encouraged in, in a way that I don't think it was when I was younger. Um, and so I see even within the indie gaming scene and the indie comic book scene that there's lots of, of um, women involved. And so it's just, you know, it's making making sure that that kind of gender representation is is really kind of represented everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and that kind of goes with, um, you know, all of this kind of representation and that sort of thing is is just having um, um, you know people at the table to kind of fill out the conversation and and I think what was kind of mentioned um, previously of you know trying when when it comes to having conversations about indigeneity or indigenous people um, having indigenous people around is is helpful um, and having that perspective for sure um, and so yeah I think that it's for me, it hasn't been um, it hasn't been a, a, a crazy thing that kind of. But I also know that, you know, having worked with these young women, it's sometimes there's this pressure to try and make yourself feel really small, or or um, you know, kind of have um, kind of tamper down your your big dreams, or or, or kind of think that maybe that, that like you know that that the I don't know the the priorities that people put um like the external media and stuff kind of like you know put on women to think that are really important um i think you know you can feel it as a teenager there's lots of pressures of of certain things and it's like you know maybe being a goofball and and nerdy or or into you know movies or or things like that you know different kinds of movies it's you know it can, there's lots of pressure to kind of fit in in a certain way. And certainly, um, yeah, just encouraging, you know, people to be exploring what they're passionate about, um, especially young indigenous people, if they, if that there's something that they're curious about exploring. Um, like we, like we mentioned, we've got lots, we've already got lots of other people's perspective. We need these young people's perspective. We need that, um, you know, we, we need um, women to be making things and indigenous people and black people to be making things because it also just like, you know, it affects the whole community if we, um, because we will hire more indigenous people. We will, you know, we will want to just like, you know, train others and, and help and mentor. And, and so it's just that kind of including, um, you know, I think that all of that is, is, uh, is a big part of it. Well, you've done a fantastic segue into my last question, so thank you, <laughs> which was, uh, I want to finish by looking to the future. And again, I've borrowed from one of our student questions who asks, how do you think Indigenous films have helped shape the identities of younger Inuit audiences? And what directions do you see future generations of Inuit filmmakers and storytellers traveling in the future? So, uh, Nyla, I don't know, you might feel like you've answered that already with what you just said, but if you've got any more to say then. Um, I mean, I will just say that there, like, there's not, for me, it was being in that theater and watching Alethea's premiere. That was the first time I'd been at something like that, where it was like, you know, everybody was there for this big thing, like, and everybody knew about it. It was this big movie that had been at this fancy festival. And it was like, you know, this, this person that was reaching global audiences and she was doing that telling um, truly like 
the stories that you know like about our families and and it was just uh you know so it's having those kinds of experiences seeing yourself reflected you don't even know um necessarily that you haven't felt that until you you know you're kind of seeing it um and certainly alethea's work and and the work that zach Konok was doing in Niglulik and continues to do um and you know with with all the work that Alethea and, and Stacey Adler McDonald and um, who's also a producer of Slashback that they're doing um, just in terms of, uh, Stacey produced this amazing show called Connerly, which is really, really funny, uh, sketch comedy. And, you know, it's, it's so important to be having all of these different kinds of, um, you know, ways of seeing yourself and, and, and not just, you know, in these kind of historical contexts um, but in, in kind of fun ways as well, and and um, and all of the different diverse ways that you kind of you know you you kind of see other things, um, and uh, certainly for me with I, I've got nephews that live up in in the Arctic, and mm -hmm. they love comic books and video games and that sort of thing, and it's like okay, I guess we got to keep making lots of that stuff, like you know. Um, because it's, uh, you know, you, you just, you want the, you want people to, to, to just see the possibilities um, and, the, and the potential as well. So, Alethea, I think you've been involved in mentoring a number of young filmmakers. And am I right in saying that Asinayak is one of them? Have I got that? Yeah. No, I, we're friends and uh, I don't know, we've, gone to film festivals together and, and all that, but I, I, I cannot say that I could claim any credit over her career. Um, she's, she's already an incredible artist and um, yeah. But yeah, ment mentorship is important to me. Um, you know, when I was starting out in this industry in 2003, um, of course there were already some filmmakers that have been at it for, for a long time, but n not in my community. I didn't have access to them. They live in different communities. And, you know, I, I was kind of felt like I was on my own a lot. Um, and it was very lonely and hard. Um, and my colleague, Stacy Arlo, who um, Nyla just mentioned, uh, she and I were both living here and struggling to just figure it out together. And so it, it was terrifying and difficult. and. Um, we kind of felt um, discouraged a lot. So anything that we can do to uh, make it a little less scary and alone <laughs> for people who are starting out now is uh, we, we try to do. Um, but our experience is also, you know, not, not that of the rest of the industry necessarily. So sometimes we're like, I don't know how helpful I can be. We've kind of just guessed at things and figured it out um, along the way. Um, but then there's also, you know, really, uh, you know, we, we have been at this at a, for a while and um, have worked with partners from all over the world and uh, do have experience now. So uh, we try to share what we know and uh, help people figure it out. Um, if we don't know how, <laughs> uh, it, it is important to me. Um, but I want to go back for a second to um, your your comment about. Um, sorry, can you remind me of the last question you asked? It was about identity and. Um, I said, uh, um, how do you think Indigenous films have helped shape the identities of younger Inuit audiences, and what directions mm -hmm. do you see future generations of Inuit filmmakers and storytellers traveling in the future? Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Um, you know, when I when I was getting start getting started out in, in filmmaking, Zachary Skinnick was all, already a, a very established uh, and known filmmaker, um, the the director of um, the Fast Runner, Atanaljot. Um, Atanaljot had not come out yet, uh, and in the film there are, are women with tattoos uh, painted on. And before the film came out, and when I would talk to people about my desire to learn more about our traditional tattoos. Um, a lot of my friends would say, what are you talking about? Like they just didn't even know that we had the tradition. Um, and then once the film came out, suddenly everybody knew exactly what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. So I, I very quickly saw the power of media um, 
to teach, to um, maintain who we are, to remind people of our history, um, to define who we want to be. And so, um, you know, I fell in love with with filmmaking, all kinds of filmmaking, particularly documentary filmmaking for me, although, although I'm kind of venturing into narrative now um, as well. But I think something that I felt a lot of pressure to do earlier in my career was to document history because of um, being colonized by um, England and France, um, you know, we are uh, uh, the vestiges of those colonial systems are they're still colonial and they're still actively um, causing destruction uh, of our language and culture and and so it's it's a constant battle to undo those mechanisms um, and and get them off our our necks um, so I was kind of hyper focused on pushing back on those systems and reclaiming choices and looking to to learn about the history that I wasn't taught in school um, and, and making sure that future generations could learn that history. But what, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not quite a full generation older than these two, um, but I am older. And um, what really has inspired me about seeing this, this next generation with us in Naya and Naila and others um, starting out um, later than me is that they feel this freedom to imagine the future. And um, it was, it really taught me to feel permission to exist in who I am now and, and not just a kind of obsess about the past and the history and which is all incredibly important stuff um, that we need to document and, and reanalyze our own history and, and write it for ourselves. Um, but it's also important for the next generation to understand that identity is something that we are always redefining for ourselves every single day and to feel permission to um, reinvent ourselves um, because that's what everyone else on the planet does um, on a day-to-day, year-to-year, generation-to-generation basis. So I'm, I'm grateful to the next slew of filmmakers coming along because uh, it's opened up um, stories that, that I want to tell um, about my present day life that I wouldn't have felt brave enough to do otherwise. Mm -hmm. And Asinaya, do you feel that freedom that Alethea is describing? Are you kind of there ready to embrace it? Um, I think so. I think what I feel is um, always trying to know myself and my voice and how I can contribute and what I think about is um, like in regards to the future is like, I see myself always on a team and we're like working together. So whatever I do, like my film work, anything, it's so that like it creates a new um, foundation and we're always building on it. So like Alethea was saying with um, the conscience becoming aware of the fact that yes, we did have tattoos and then the working on it, putting in action more, that's all us like growing off of each other. And I think um, that's what I'm excited for. And I think that when we allow ourselves to be imaginative, um, then it's like opening it more and more and more for the people who follow us. I don't think I can think of a better place to end this conversation. Thank you all for the time that you've given uh, to the Big Freeze Festival. It's been a complete privilege to have the chance to speak to you all. Do any of you have any final words that you desperately want to get across? No. Thank you, you for having me. Oh, you're very welcome. As I say, it's been a complete pleasure. Um, so for those people at home, you can catch the films as part of the festival, they're available for 24 hours. Um, so hopefully you've had a chance to register. And uh, thank you to Asinayak, to Alithia and to Naila. It's been a pleasure. Thanks so much.